For this final portion, uh, we're going to step through actually creating the cinematics and the process that we went through to create essentially the results that you're seeing on screen right now. Um, and this is using the cinematic sequencer in Unreal um, and then just a single solo camera uh, that we control through a shot track. So let's go ahead and get started. The process by which we're going to um, kind of attack putting this thing together is by creating these various shots. Um, and the idea behind that is that we have a single camera that we can control in these individual shots and we will then later put these shots into a master track to be able to control which ones come where so we're not having to move individual keys but rather just our individual shots. Um, so the process I'm going to show you is how we set up the initial shot one track um, and then the rest is all just kind of uh, rinse and repeat from there. So to get started, um, I'm going to go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll hide this guy. Um, but in general, um, the way that we start here is if we go into our cinematics, we can just add our cinematic camera actor, which we can see here. Um, the cool part about using a shot track setup is that you only have to control one camera. So we're not having to place a bunch of multiple cameras. Now with it, there's a couple things that we do want to take note of. And that, um, that is all of these settings here in the actual camera setting. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete this guy um, and I will open up the cinematic camera that we have for this one. Um, so in here, the shot that we're using uh, for shot one, we've gone ahead and just made these changes. So film back settings, we've set to custom, um, which I think is at the top. And then we've gone and we've changed our sensor width and sensor height to be able to get us our cinematic view uh, view, but then we've also gone in and we've changed uh, the zoom of it because um, by default I think it's about 90 degree field of view, but we wanted something a little bit tighter to give it more of a you know kind of realistic look. Um, then we've also gone in and changed our focus settings. Now what you'll notice um, the the term in in film is called a rack focus, and what that is is where you focus on something maybe in the foreground and then you focus to something say in the foreground. Now, um, it's difficult to know, so if I kind of scrub through this track, you can see that, um, you know, we, we focus on kind of the tree, the tree trunk that's in the front, but then we rack focus to something that's in the background. Um, you can do this kind of manually and guess those distances, but in the actual cinematic camera, there's this draw debug focus plane. So if I enable that, we can see on the actual camera actor, it's represented by kind of this purple. Um, if I take this, hopefully it won't do anything. You can see as I push that back and forth, you can see that it, it shows where the focus plane is. Um, so this is something that we use throughout, um, that I use throughout the whole process of doing this camera. So you can see here the debug plane is kind of right behind that front tree trunk. But then as we move, it quickly focuses to, um, you know, something that's kind of in the background. So that's one of the things that I used a lot when setting up these shot tracks. So, okay, now that we kind of covered the basics of how we have the camera, how do we go about setting up our actual shot tracks? So let's dive into that real quick. So the process for setting up your shot tracks is very simple. If we right click in the content browser and under animation, we do level sequence and we create a new sequence. We can call this shot, I'll just name it zero zero since it's there and then we'll open up our shot track. Now, in this situation, because I'm using the scene that I kind of built ahead of time, I don't have that cinematic camera. Now, granted, if I had it here, I could just do this, simply right click, add actor to sequence, and I can click that cinema camera actor, which we see 346, it's the same here, and it will add that track to our shot. Um, and in here, this is where we have all of our settings exposed. So you can see we've got camera length, focus distance, aperture, and then our transform. Um, so with this, uh, you may notice that some of these have actual, like it's kind of like a little triangle and a plus sign. That means you can add a keyframe, whether it's in the details panel or um, in your sequencer settings. So let me go ahead and move this down and I'll show you the process for which um, we're setting up the cinematic. Now, if you notice in my viewport, um, I've got both my perspective view and my cinema camera actor here. If you click this camera icon, it will lock the viewport to that camera. So then I can go up here. If you notice, I can't move it. Um, if I uncheck this, it'll kind of it zooms out a little bit there, but now I'm actually in my perspective view. I can click this again, go to cinema camera here, and now I can move it. Um, so if you do the lock view here, you can see that it locks, but if I click and select it, 
now I can move around. Actually, let me uncheck this. So now we should be in, there we go. So now we're unlocked, I can move around. So if I go up here now, I'm gonna change this guy to my cinema camera actor. So now I'm actually controlling this. Um, so I'll show you real quick. So let's say that we're gonna set up a, a shot here um, where you know maybe we, we rise up and we turn to the left. Or yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Okay, so I have my camera in position. Now to set my key tracks, um, this is the important part. So my camera set up now, I can see I'm piloting it, and I've got it, let's say, in the starting position that I want. So I can go down here to my transform, and I can click this plus to just go ahead and create a key for all of these guys. Um, you can also individually select each one and add a key. So let's go ahead and just add one right here to our, actually, oops, I grabbed location. There we go. So now we've added one to our transform. Okay, and I'm going to scrub to the end, and let's say, you know, 150 frames. I'm going to be up at this location, and I'll go ahead and do a transform. So now if we scrub back, you can see we have those keys. Okay, so that's the first part. Um, actually, you know what, let's cover this real fast. So in there, if we play it, you can see that it starts out smoothly, and then it comes up to kind of a smooth stop. This is great, and you've probably seen this before with other people making videos, that it kind of has all of this, you know, this smooth in, smooth out. Maybe that's not what we want. Again, because if we go back, we're doing a shot by shot, maybe we want just a continuous, seamless flow. So how do we change that? Um, that brings me into kind of the next point that I want to cover, which is the idea of key interpolation. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into that, and it'll make more sense as we dive into it. Okay, so the question is, what is key interpolation? That is really just, you know, how the key interpolates uh, the movement coming in and going out. So if we go under this, we do the show animation keys in curve editor, and I'll expand this out a little bit. Um, we can see that we have all the keys exposed because we have this selected. Now granted, if let's select our transform, press F to, to frame it, you can see that we didn't change. So for example, I select X, we really didn't change our X direction our Y direction, we didn't change either. We simply just moved the camera up. So if we look at this curve, this is what I mean by interpolation. So if we start playing the, the frame, you can see that we smooth in, or I'm sorry, we smooth out, and then we smooth in as well. So what happens if we change these keys? So I'm gonna select both of these. You can select one at a time, and I'm gonna go up here, and I'm gonna change these to, um, let's change it to linear. So now we've got our curve that just goes straight from point to point. So what does that look like? If we play, you can see that it no longer smooths in and it no longer smooths out. It's just a straight movement. This may be what we want. Again, if we're going from shot to shot um, and it's just straight cuts, we won't need that smooth in, smooth out, smooth in, smooth out. I think you get the point. Um, the other thing as well is that we can go in here, if we undo this, we can actually select any of our keys and grab these handles and move them. So this will get us, you know, let's let's try something here. So. By looking at this, again, if, you, if you've got an animation background, you'll probably understand this, but if you don't, we can still kind of, um, we can figure out what's going on here. So as our camera moves from this point, we can see that its position stays relatively the same. So this is our X direction, right? We go from, from being down here to eventually being up here at this point. So it'll stay down much, much longer, and then as it gets towards the end, it'll start ramping up really fastly. So let's go ahead and play that, and we'll see what happens. So it stays there, and then there we go, and now it starts to ramp up. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of using the curve editor. So um, you'll find that, and, and we'll kind of go through uh, the other shots are established, and we'll take a look at that as well. Uh, but that is the first kind of key thing to recognize that's really going to help shape your cinematics um, is actually going into this graph and changing your keys. Again, if you select each track, you'll see them individually. If you select the parent, you'll see all three. Um, so that kind of covers our graph editor. Um, so let's go ahead and set to the next process, which is giving us that really nice, rich depth with the camera in our um, uh, kind of our, our rack focus. So we'll step into that next. I've gone ahead and opened up our uh, Shot01 in our browser, um, our content browser, um, and I'm going to step through real fast how we get this rich depth. So I'm going to go ahead and click this camera to lock the viewport. Again, if you remember, I can't pilot it because I'm still I'm I'm in my perspective technically, but I'm viewing this camera in the viewport. Um, so in order to get this really rich depth of field, there's a couple settings that you're probably going to want to check. Um, 
in your actual camera setup. So I'm gonna leave this up here just so you can kind of um, see the, the settings that I have um, up here. But in particular, it's this manual focus distance. So let me go ahead and select our camera actor here. And there we go. So focus method is manual, focus distance. Um, and you can actually use this dropper too to kind of grab the point distance, which is great. And then I've got my draw debug uh, focus plane turned on. Uh, and then lastly, these are the settings that you want to focus on. Focus offset, camera focal length, and camera aperture. Uh, by setting your camera aperture lower, again, this goes back to traditional cinematography, by having a lower aperture, you're going to get that really nice, rich depth of field. Um, so we're going to want to lower that, and I used 1.2. Um, that's actually a, um, a, a film, um, a, a common thing used with apertures. Um, so those are settings that I use to help you get it. Um, you will find that if it's set too high, and I check this off, you can see we, we don't have that, that blurry background. So that's your that's probably your biggest point, is just to make sure your camera aperture is set. Okay, so if you remember earlier, we set our transform location, right? So it's just simply moving, we've got those keys. But what I've gone in and done as well, is under our manual focus distance, I've gone ahead and set a key at the start. So again, 97 is kind of this close, close kind of tree trunk here. And then we rack focus it out to this point to about 2000, which is you know somewhere, somewhere in kind of these this tree range. We'll go ahead and delete our other cinema camera actors so we don't have them in there. Um, and that was the process of you know as this camera moves, we rack focus out and then it finishes. So let's go ahead and open up the graph editor because um, I said I was going to mention that and take a look at our transforms. So you can see that I've. I've made all of our curves linear because I know I'm doing a shot by shot track. I don't want it to smooth out to smooth in. So that was the first change. Um, and then I can check my manual focus distance. And the reason I kept this kind of at this, this cubic curve, so it smooths out, smooths in, and not linear, is because, you know, I if you approach your camera and your cinematics as if you were using a real camera, right? Like you're gonna sit there, you're gonna hold, and then as it moves, then you're gonna turn to focus. But right, you're not just gonna immediately start and then stop exactly on it. You're gonna kind of smooth into it. So by using this cubic curve that's a little bit smoother, I'm kind of mimicking the human interaction with my cinematic camera. So just a little trick there to help make it feel a little bit more natural. Okay, so at this point, this pretty much concludes this shot that we have. Um, and from this point, I've simply gone in and I've just duplicated this original one, gone in, um, reset my transforms, my focus distance, my focal length, maybe my camera aperture, and I simply just move the camera. So if I look at shot two, we'll open this real fast, and we'll show him. So I started down kind of at this lower section. There's all of our transforms. We'll roll these guys up. There's our focus distance, focus length, uh, camera aperture, and then I simply just moved on this one. And you just rinse and repeat. So that establishes all of our shots that we want. So for random, we'll take a look at five. We have here kind of a similar thing, movement, camera aperture, all that. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of that, you know, this is pretty much just duplicating each of these shots and giving me a bunch of variations. Um, so that's it, that's our basic shot. So now the next process we do from this point is actually setting them up into kind of our final cinematic sequence that we want. So let's step through that process. So the first thing that I wanna do with my cinematic sequence is to go ahead and right click in my content browser and underneath animation, I want to do a new level sequence. So if I do the new level sequence and we'll just call this test, I'll show you, and we double click to open it, it's blank. Now we can right click in here and we can add actor to sequence, we can go in and do shot tracks, we can click shot track here, but I find it just as easy if you just wanna select all the shots. So let's say we wanted one, two, we wanted three, and let's say maybe 10. And you just click drag them in there, it will automatically create for you a shot track. So if you remember from when we created our original um, sequences, we added the camera. In this case, we're just adding the shots. So one thing to note about this process, why I love this so much more for cinematics versus trying to do you know the camera individually, is now I'm manipulating the shot track itself as opposed to the camera and the keyframes. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we expand our timeline out, let's say we'll take it out to a thousand frames you can see that we have all of our individual shot tracks here. But I can move these shot tracks, so say you know I want them to go one after the other, maybe we'll go here, like this. 
Um, we'll go ahead and move our end playback to the end of this as well, so we capture all of it. But now I I have these individual shots. But let's say that I don't want to you know to come before three. Maybe I want to switch those. I can do that. But it doesn't change the keyframes in our original shot. So if you remember from our shot, we go from zero to three hundred frames. If I tried to do that same process in our sequence, I would have to move all of those keyframes again from zero to three hundred. I would have to move all those keyframes with that shot as opposed to just moving the shot. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully I didn't confuse you there. Um, but just know that this process is way easier and much more iterative and much faster to getting your cinematic effect that you want at the end by using the shot track versus trying to just control everything in one um, actual cinematic sequence with the camera. So again, hopefully that makes sense. So, okay. I digress though. Let's go back to what we were talking about. All right, so we've created our new level sequence. We've dropped our shot tracks in there, and now we have this shot track. So if I do the camera locked to viewport, this is where I can see. So let's go ahead and play it. It's going to go through my shot one, and then it's immediately going to jump to my shot two. So this is great. This is the effect that we want, so we can start adjusting things. And what's cool about this, so if I pause here, maybe I want shot three to come after shot two, and I'll move shot two here, go back to the start, and now I can play it. I can look at everything. Like, okay, this is good. That's a good progression, which works well. Again, I know we're just kind of watching the video here, and it goes through. So now I'm telling my story. I'm I'm giving the effect that I want. What's really cool about this though is at any point I can double click one of these shots to go into it, and I can readjust here. Let's say that maybe this movement was too slow or too fast. I can still go into that original shot track and adjust my keys like I could normally, which is great. Then I can jump back to, um, I can either click it here or I can click it here to jump back up to my parent. Now, if you notice that the camera shifted back to perspective, you are going to have to click this again, lock the viewport. Now we can see we're in our cinematic view. And there we go. So that's, that's the process of creating your cinematics. And really, the only thing after this point to do is to go in and actually render this out. So... Um, if I just click this render to movie, you can see we get a video sequence, our frame rate, our resolution. I can expand this out, burn in options. If you want to do like a watermark or something, you can. That's fine. The next thing is your video encoding. Since this will pump out, I believe it is an uncompressed AVI, uh, you may want to have some of that compression quality in there. Um, so we'll just use compression to make it a little bit lighter, a little bit easier. And then finally, setting your output directory file format. Um, and then you can do... Um, I think most of that stuff should be fine. Um, and then it will render the sequence out. There is one thing, though, that I do want to kind of make a note of. Let me see if I can find um, where this is at. Um, let's expand out all of, our, all of our assets here. Okay, it's underneath the animation tab, and that is this warm-up frame count. What you may notice when you go to render out your cinematic sequences is that you may get these pops at the start. So you go to render it and it's like all of a sudden pop, everything comes in and you're kind of wondering what's happening here. By creating this warm up frame count and delay before your warm up, what it does is when the engine goes to render out your cinematic, it will use this frame count as it'll, it'll start and do your 10 frames, which we have set here, and then it starts rendering. Um, I usually try to leave this for around 10, maybe 20, um, to make sure that all my textures have streamed in, everything's fully loaded. If we have dynamics on things, it's already running. So this may be a little trick to help you with those initial pops so you don't have to go in and do a post thing um, afterwards and cut those frames off. And really after that point, it's just capture movie. It will run in the background, it will capture everything, and then you have your uncompressed AVI. Um, so that really is the process of creating your cinematic sequences again i know this was kind of a, a quick run through but you know as you're putting together demos or maybe this is for your portfolio or maybe you're just trying to send something to a client really quickly to you know capture your scene this is a very very quick and fast iterative workflow for that so that kind of concludes the third part of the series. Um, I hope this helped. Um, if you guys have suggestions or comments um, on this, if you want me to dive deeper in this stuff, absolutely drop um, a comment in the comment section. I read all of those. And as always, I really appreciate you guys' support, and I'll catch you on the next one.